so uh, I'm talking about creating reusable components in the UI. I think this conference has kind of centralized a lot of around uh, component design versus page design. I think that's the way that things are moving in general uh, in web design, and Drupal makes this really easy uh, with a couple of contributed modules and uh, a theme called Zerg Foundation. So basically the idea is I want to give content editors as much control as I can over layout instead of relying completely on theming and, de and developers to create an experience for um, a person who's maintaining a website. Who am I? My name is Jim Fisk. I work at a company called Janku. It's a design and development agency focusing primarily on content management systems, uh, primarily Drupal, and my handle is Jim A. Fisk on most of the social things that you can find online. Um, here's a few of the ones I'm on, but I'm on others as well. So look for me at Jim A. Fisk and can keep that conversation going after the uh, session. So Zerg Foundation 6 is um, it's a framework for front-end design. Uh, it has a really powerful 12-column grid system, so if you're not familiar with it, it's similar to Bootstrap. I find it a little more uh, flexible and easier to work with, and there's a, a base theme on Drupal.org at this URL there, um, where you can download the theme, and I find it actually integrates really well with Drupal, and it's super easy to use. So if you're using Drush, you can easily download this theme with Drush DL, and then you would enable it, and then to clear your caches, you can actually run a foundation sub-theme command FST and create a theme that way. And it's really easy to get up and running, and you can just, in this presentation, we're going to basically just go over some of the, the grid classes you can use, but you can do a lot of powerful things on the front end with Zerg Foundation. So, I'm also going to be using paragraphs, and the idea is we can get this atomic design approach, and um, kind of like Ethan mentioned earlier, people have different variations of, of where they actually draw the distinctions between some of these elements, especially molecules and organisms. Uh, I'm going to define my own kind of way of doing this. So we think of an atom as um, a very small uh, piece of functionality. So it would be something like an input, or maybe a label for that input, or it would be a button for submitting that. A molecule would maybe be the combination of those things, a label with an input, and maybe uh, a button to submit maybe a search form. And then we have an organism where you can com combine that search form with maybe um, a logo that would create a, a header um, section if you have these things kind of working together. And the way I've defined these things through paragraphs is my atoms are essentially a paragraph that is a simple Drupal field. So it's either a body field or an attachment or an email field, and it's a fundamental uh, level element and um, my molecules are kind of more configurable groups of elements. So, um, for instance, you can put some of those things together and you can create something like a header. And in a header, you can specify what the text is, you can specify a color, you can specify whether it's an H1, H2, H3, so sizing elements. Um, you can link an image, so basically you would have a link and an image, and you would make your image clickable to go to a destination. An organism is our layout and our structure, and that's how we kind of define, have the user define how things are placed onto a page. And the two organisms that we're creating through here is uh, called a banner and a container. A banner basically will give you that edge to edge experience that a lot of people ask for these days. Um, sometimes I, I get clients complaining that things are stuck in a gutter. If you have a banner, you can basically have an edge to edge thing and then have something in the middle inside a content container. Um, and then containers will allow us to, to leverage the, the 12 column grid system that foundation ships with. So you can easily um, you know, specify something to be half the screen and, and just rearrange things and have the whole responsive design kind of rearrange elements on the fly really easily. So I want to kind of take this approach a little differently than I've taken some of uh, my other talks when I've done something on this topic before. And basically take a look at what this looks like and how this functions right up front before we hop into some code. I want to get into some examples and just show very basic level how to set some of this stuff up. Um, so I originally did this for uh, Nice Camp uh, in New York City. Um, so some of the stuff is still uh, named after that convention, but I updated it a little bit, but I was too lazy to kind of go through the whole process of changing everything. So you have to bear with me a little bit. But essentially, this is kind of what the final product looks like. So you have a page here, um, you have a header with some information, uh, a hero image, then you have three columns, uh, section, another full span name, and then you have maybe some sponsors and a footer. And what's interesting about this page is it's actually 
only using two regions. And it really only needs to use one region. The rest of this is created without any real custom CSS. Um, it's really just created through paragraph interface and overriding templates and making these things really configurable for someone uh, who's a user. And so I'll go through and look at what some of it looks like from the admin perspective. So on the home page, everything here is arranged into blocks. You'll notice that in the header region, we have a block here. Um, if you were to look at this, it is um, a component that I'm calling a link image. So you can upload an image, you can upload a link, and that image will link to that content. So for instance, this links to the home page if you were to click on it. Um, we have a menu up here, then we have another section here. This is a hero image. And basically, this is a banner with a body text in it, in a header. So you start with a banner, you have the ability to upload an image. Um, alternatively, I made banners so you can do a hero image or a striped color. I wanted to make only one component to do those, and you choose between uploading an image or doing a color. Um, within the banner, I add other components, such as a header, which I set a green color, and I make it an H1. And below that, I set a body um, component that can be added, so you get that kind of hero with an image and um, text there. And you can configure things like setting the text color of some of these things. Similarly, these are all set up in the same way. So this three column would be using containers to essentially uh, pull classes from Zerg Foundation. So I would say that these, this is four large columns. Um, so that goes into 12 three times. So you get the three column layout. Um, and this is added using something called Classy Paragraphs. It's another contributor module that works with, with paragraphs. So you can add classes and kind of manipulate things that way. Um, and then within um, a column, I would just set a header and a body, and then I would also add a button, um, which is another paragraph component that I defined. So you'll, you'll notice that basically all these sections here are defined in the same way. They're using a block that I have created, a custom block I have created um, that I named Builder. And essentially what that looks like is very simple. I created this builder block here, and it create, has one field, which is an entity reference to paragraphs. And what I did is these different components are paragraphs that I defined. And I'll just take a quick look at what that looks like. So in your interface, you go under structure, you have the paragraphs module installed. You can set up paragraphs this way, and I created just all these things that I can reference in my builder uh, blocks. So attachment is a simple one. I would call that, you know, more similar to an atom. Um, versus a banner would be more of my organism. I can arrange things and, um, for instance, something like a header or a linked image or a linked icon would be something I would consider more um, of a molecule. Um, so you can also create content outside of blocks. So maybe you don't want, I think the, the block builders are great for like headers and footers and things like that. So you can have them persist across pages and you can you know, define the paths that they're on. But I think it's also good to have um, these, these builder kind of elements into a page too, so it's really easy to add content. So for instance, we can create a page here. Um, again, I created a builder content type that's very similar to a block, it has one field. And I would call this test D4D. And I might want to start with a banner. And maybe we want to set the banner to have I don't know, a blue background. Um, and then I could, inside the banner, I could add some body text. Um, this is the body And I could set the body text to be white, for instance, like that. Um, and then maybe I also want to add just a quick button. Um, the button goes to google.com. Um, and it says Googling, and maybe um, the color of the button is uh, green. Yeah, it would be green, and the link color is also white. So, save this, see what this looks like. Oops. Uh, pass. Okay, so since this is an external pass. So, I mean, so now we have a basic page that is created here. Um, 
you know, it has the title, it has some of these, these other elements here, uh, but you get a full standing banner really easily right across the top there. Um, so I had created a test page before this. Uh, it looks essentially very similar to that. You can just quickly just add things to this page super easily. Um, and the, the content editor can create this without really going in and writing any style or any templating. It's just a component that they can use um, super easily. And for instance, maybe we really like something like this, this um, We Love Drupal, and we want this to be kind of part of the footer. You could very easily just go and add that as a block in your block layout. <coughs> so we only have two regions here. Um, we just add a block, a custom block here, make it a builder. Um, say we'll call it of Drupal, and we just add a banner, set the image to Drupal banner, and uh, let's see this. We don't want the title to display, but we want this to be in the full region, and we want this just to appear right above the footer. If I save that, Go back to the site. You notice we now have that, that as part of our footer. So that's across all our pages. So it's really flexible and easy to add some of these elements here. Um, another component I just want to show real quick is uh, the, the link icon. So basically, what I'm doing here is I'm using Font Awesome icons to upload a select list of all icons. So you can just easily come in here, select an icon, pick a color for it, give it a size and then link where it's going to go to, and you can create social icons and all sorts of icons really easily throughout your system. So, so that's basically what it looks like. Um, I want to show you just quickly some of the markup, uh, how to set something like this up, like really simply. Uh, it's really easy. So I have my, um, my system over here, and uh, right now I'm in the uh, templates. Uh, can you guys see this down here? Maybe not very well. Um, okay, so I'm in the templates folder of my project, um, and basically, I'm doing a couple things. I'm simplifying the, the page um, .html.twig. So if you notice, this, this, this template usually has a ton of regions, right? It has a meta header, a header, help, highlighted, first sidebar, second sidebar, and everything. But basically, I removed everything besides a header and a full spanning region. And you also notice something about the full spanning region. It doesn't have any kind of container classes. So Zerg Foundation has a class called Row, and what Row does is it puts things into a container. And if you put all your content in that Row container, you're going to have a lot of trouble having images or colors bleed out to the sides and having that full kind of experience. So I'm putting everything into a full container, and then I'm setting that actual content container in different ways because you know we don't want our content always going edge to edge and having things all over the place. Sometimes we want our text within the gutters, but we want our things to be able to go full edge. So I'm simplifying everything, I'm putting everything in the full region here. Um, I'm actually going and I'm removing all these regions from the info file, I'm just comment, commenting them out for now. And then on my block uh, interface, I just make careful um, decision to remove all the blocks from those regions before I kind of delete them and put them into my full region. So everything is in the full region. And essentially, even that footer that is kind of fine on all pages is in the full region. And you could do something similar with the header, I just didn't do it. So now you have this experience that is really easy for um, a simple site, for a site builder to kind of take control um, and over to the content admin where they can kind of create these layouts on the fly without writing any code or touching anything um, too complex. So how do you create this structure for them to do that? You have to overwrite templates. So um, are people pretty familiar with overwrite templates? I, I can just quickly show what this looks like. So basically, um, it becomes a lot easier uh, with Drupal 8. You can set your, and I think this is actually, this is Drupal 7 now too. Um, you want to set your debugging to true, and, and what they'll do is they'll essentially give you some contextual information on the front of your page about what is producing what. So for instance, you can see that this content here, if I hover over it, you see it, it highlights you know, this section here. So this content is being produced by a field template right here, and it also says, okay, um, I think there's theme suggestions here. So essentially, I could overwrite this template by copying it from either the base theme or Drupal core, wherever it's coming from, and I could copy it to my sub theme, 
and there's levels of specificity that go up as you go higher. So, you know, this is for just like general fields, but we could set it for just the field header and like more specific up and up as you go up the chain. So I would just basically copy that, that template, rename it, and put it into my theme. Um, so I, I also want to show you just like quickly how you turn that on. So if I were to go to the um, base root of my project, um, actually I'm going to go to the web root, and if I were to look into my sites folder, um, there is a example settings.local file. Basically, you want to copy that file and you want to put it into the uh, site's default settings.local.php and you just want to quickly change your settings. Oops. Your settings.php, you want to basically uncomment this block of code so it knows to look for that file. And when it's looking for that file, you also want to um, do one more thing. You want to um, you want to also just enable development services.yaml. Um, so uncomment this line here, and then again copy from from sites from sites development service.yaml, uh, and just basically um, you want to set that to have this file. Um, this is the important part. Uh, twig config, set your debug to true. I also want to disable some caches and make it easier so I don't have to clear caches every time I'm reloading the page so I can write some style and things like that. It'll basically update really quickly. Um, so that's how you do that. And then you just copy those, the, the, file, the templates that you see and when you look at the front of your browser where you see those naming conventions, copy from your base theme. Put them into your sub theme in your, your, uh, your templates folder. I like to do a sub folder called paragraph so it's really clear where all these, these kind of components are, are uh, staying. And I, they all follow the same naming convention where it's paragraph, hyphen, hyphen, the name, the machine name of uh, your paragraph component that you created. Um, just convert any underscores to hyphens. And then you've created a theme override. It's super easy. Um, so if you take a look at my templates folder, for instance, and you look in the paragraphs, you'll notice we have all these paragraphs. And that's so that's great. So that's that's nice and easy. You're, you're overriding some yeah. paragraphs, right? Where do you um, get the base template? Is that coming from the par paragraphs module? The base templates. Um, so yeah. so what, what, what are you copying to get started? That's a good question. Um, you know, it's been so long since I set this up. I, I don't know. I mean, so the, the Twig debug will tell you. It'll tell you exactly where it is. I, I, can't, I can't remember if it's coming from that or if it's coming from. It must be coming from the paragraphs module. I think so. It has to be, because I don't think Zer or anything else knows about paragraphs. So yeah, I think the base templates are coming from the paragraphs module. It's been a while since I did it, but the thing is, if you look at your browser, um, it will be very apparent. So you look at look at the section you want. So for instance, if we were interested in this banner, you know, we could look up here and, okay, so this looks like the, the body section here, right? Maybe we want to go up a little higher and say, um, we want this whole kind of paragraph here, right? We can look at that and we can see that it's coming from, right now it's coming from our, our themes nice camp. So it's our sub theme because I've already overridden it, but had I not overridden it, it would have shown where the face is and you could grab that and copy it and just easily put it in there. So by turning on the, the Twig debug settings, it makes it really easy to find where that stuff is. But uh, I think that happens to a lot of people when they copy that, that base template, they say, well, how do I find the value? Okay, so yeah, I, I know I'm getting, um, for, the, for the banner, I'm getting an image and maybe I have, um, you know, I have some information about, uh, a header, um, a heading with an H1, and I have a body text and some links, but where do I get those values to manipulate them and, and manipulate the display? Um, well, there's a really helpful module um, that I recently just started looking into called Twig X Debug. Um, so you can't really easily do an X Debug. So is, are people familiar with X Debug? It's, um, a, yeah, it's a debugging system for PHP, so you can't easily debug um, a Twig template um, with X Debug. Um, so this module makes that possible, and basically if you're using a Drupal Composer project, um, you just download the module, so Composer require, um, pass the dev flag because you don't want this in production or any other environment, you only really want it for your, your development when you're building this site. Um, Drupal Twig, uh, Twig and then also require this library here, um, Composer. Um, so are people familiar with Composer? Have they kind of installed this stuff in the past? But that, that's basically how you do it. And then you can set some breakpoints 
in your tweet templates using uh, this, this little convention here. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Let's just edit paragraph uh, linked image. Okay. Oh, so we have linked image here, and if I do a breakpoint, so I set a breakpoint, and now um, if I run my, I have um, Vim installed the next debug, and if I run my debugging session, and then I go and I reload my page, you'll notice that um, it has started debugging, and if I try to run to the next breakpoint, oh no. Um, so I'm looking for a linked image, and I don't have any linked images on this page. What will happen here? You forget to break it. Oh, did I forget to break it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, you have to write it correctly. It won't work. If it's perfect. Um, okay. So I think at least you know this is not a fake code. Yeah. No. Yeah. This is not a video. I'm like here messing up in front of you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So I, I run that. Um, I'm going to shrink this a little bit because it's a little. The screen size is a little wonky. Um, so. Is that, is that okay for people? Can you still see that? Yeah. Okay. So you notice I start running a debugging session, um, and then if I just run my code to the breakpoint, okay, so now we're, we're at a breakpoint, you'll notice like, hey, this isn't my file, right? So it's, it actually is using model code. It's kind of like a little trick. So our file over here is our, our template, um, but this is the, the kind of like trick that we're using to see some of the, the variables available here. So since I've already written some of this code, you can see, um, we're looking for, we're setting a link variable here in our Twig template called field link image. We're getting the, the title value from uh, this linked image field. And that's something we created in our paragraph where we created a, a linked image field. And we also created, sorry, a linked image link field and we created a linked image image field. Uh, I'm getting the, the link image link field here. Uh, but basically if I was running my XP bug session, I could come in here, um, and I could look into uh, my context um, variable, I could look into my content, um, I could look at my linked image link field, and I could actually go through here and I could say, um, uh, where is that value? And okay, so here's my title. So basically I'm seeing here, it's getting the value of the forward slash just because in our header we had that linked image that was going to the home page, which is a forward slash. Um, but I can get that value here. So you can see how you can make these configurable components where you're saying, okay, produce this component based on the input that the user's given me instead of some like hard code thing that I'm doing here. And you can make these components super easy. Um, and what I would basically do here at this point is I would, I would you know, copy this, I would, I would take this over to my template and say, you know, hey, I want to put some of this value here. Um, basically, with when you're writing a twig, you can replace these brackets typically with this dot notation. If you have one of these kind of like more complex like character things, you, you do have to kind of still keep them in the brackets. But that's just like the syntax that you'd be using when you're grabbing these values and putting them in there. Um, is that is that all kind of making sense? Are people with me on this so far? Um, does anyone have any questions on what I'm talking about here? Um, so yeah, so that's that is um, like what a debugging session um, would would generally look like, um, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, you can create complex things throughout throughout the system, right? So this is a very simple uh, uh, um, representation of that. But for instance, you could look at something that's a little more. Um, a little more complicated, um, such as a banner. Um, we're setting background images here. Uh, so we set the background image based on user uploaded content, and then what we're doing is we're saying, okay, since we're setting that background image, 
and the, the component can have many nested components within it. We want to let all those components display themselves, that's the, the content in there, but we don't want that background image to display again, or the, um, the background color, because you can do a striped color, you can do an image. So I just pass a twig filter without, when I say, without the field that we're potentially um, setting as a background as well. Right, so, you know, give us, give us the background image, put that edge to edge, display all its child elements underneath it, um, and let them kind of have their own uh, paragraph overrides with templates and everything, and then just remove the stuff that we've already written. So you can do like a lot of like kind of configurable things here. Okay. So, um, so SMAX. So Zero Foundation uh, uses this um, scalable modular architecture for CSS. And I think a lot of people have talked about it today. I think uh, Drupal's kind of adopting it as, as a whole. Um, so for people who aren't really familiar with what this general paradigm is, um, it's, it's a way to arrange your CSS in a way so it's, it's more scalable and more sustainable. Um, it can be maintained by, by many people, and especially if we kind of follow um, a, a way of doing things that's easier for people to pick up and collaborate across projects, especially, you know, everyone has their own way of doing things, so following this kind of structure makes it easier for everybody to follow. Um, and some of the basic principles here are there are base rules. Um, base rules would essentially be like actual HTML elements, like if you're putting um, what what do inputs generally look like across the site, what do head, like what, what does the header look like across the site, so like actual HTML elements um, instead of like classes um, or like IDs and things like that. So set your base here. Um, things like CSS resets would be set here at your base, so you just kind of like have a general uh, palette of things that you'd be using on your site. You put your layouts into their own section, um, so that's kind of positional things and structural things of how things are laid out on a page. Um, modules, this is what we're going to focus on and kind of look at together because that's the approach we're taking on this kind of component-based web design. Uh, we want our modules to be reusable components that can be used in different places, um, and there's no reason that, you know, because you're on a news article page, which is different than an event page, but you're using the same similar widget, you shouldn't style those things individually. You shouldn't be like, news page, widget that's exactly the same as the event page widget, right? You should really just create a widget. Um, and that's kind of what you would set as like a module. Um, state, I think, I don't know if this has kind of changed since last time I talked about, like, states in my mind are things like changing like, um, so like, uh, you know, um, like an active class, like you can click on something and be different um, if it's like active or like a, an accordion that's expanded or contracted. Um, but I also think of states as um, kind of like media query things. Like, I don't know if they call that now changing states or if, they just, if there's a distinction between those two. Um, but I, I think of just like things that would change based on interactions um, with your website would be a state. And then themes, I think of more of like colors and, and, and font families and like things that go into to regions, specific regions that are part of. Uh, you know, your actual base kind of like style on the other side. Um, uh, but the way we're, we're kind of doing this demo um, and making this, this hopefully, you know, Squarespace-esque kind of like user interface for, for content editors to have more control, um, we're really going to be focusing on just like looking at what a module would look like. Okay, so um, let me just take a look at what that looks like in my theme here. So um, if I go to my SCSS folder, You'll notice um, we're in our project, we're in our theme. Uh, the sub theme for Zero Foundation has an SCSS folder that ships with it. That's just our SAS folder. SAS, for anyone who's not familiar, SAS is a compiler for CSS. I think most people are using SAS these days. Fancy way of writing CSS. You can do things like variables and, and functions they call mixins, and you can do a lot of like really powerful things. Really great cross-browser support, um, and it's, it's, a, it's an awesome way to. Um, to, to manage your style code. Uh, if you're not using the big thing that's sold down SAS is, is just, you know, for instance, say you have a theme, you have a, a, vari a variable list of colors, and in the future, if you want to repurpose that theme or use something else, you can easily just change colors in, in maybe like six spots where you define those variables, and it will propagate throughout your system instead of going, finding, replacing, and doing stuff like that. So there's a lot of applications for SAS. This is set up in that, that paradigm, basically using the SMACS, um, Structure. So out of the box, this is going to come with a base folder, a layouts folder, modules folder, 
um, states a theme in a settings form. So settings uh, is great. You can actually set some, some things like breakpoints and, and variables and, and forms and things like that right in your settings folder and that will kind of go throughout your system. Uh, and then basically your, your theme name, that SCSS folder, is where you import all your different files. Um, so you have all these, all these different files within these, these folders. It aggregates them into one file and then you compile that with you know, Gulp or whatever your build process is into the CSS that is actually rendered by your browser. Um, but, uh, so basically, um, I just want to show some real quick thing that I did inside of um, my, my main CSS file. So you'll notice that I did this star character here because I don't want to have to, every time I add a module, because there's going to be a lot of them based on the components of the build on our site, I don't want to have to do an individual include for each one of those files. So I had that star character. It's using something called um, uh, SAS globbing. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. Um, and it's possible that Foundation even ships with this now. This is an older version that I had stuff themed off of. I hope they added it, but if they haven't added it, um, I think it's a really good thing to add. So uh, essentially what you want to do is you want to npm install this um, into your system. And then after you install it, you just want to make a couple quick adjustments to your build file. Um, and essentially you want to add this require line here. And um, after you kind of load it into this variable, you just want to pipe this in before your SAS call. And after you do that, you should be able to um, easily run your npm compiler and it won't hiccup at your little star character and you'll be able to just you know continually add files to that um, directory structure it'll automatically be compiled with everything else so that, does that make sense if you that? okay um, so let's switch back to this so so for instance let's take a look at this home page here um, and so far most of this is really created without much style we're really taking um, the user input, and we're kind of manipulating the template, and we're spitting that out um, to the user. But for, for instance, say we want to actually have this be a little more styled. Um, I think an easy thing to represent is maybe we want these links in the body components here to be a little bit bigger than the rest of the text. It would kind of look like a ransom note or something, but um, <laughs> for, for whatever reason, if we, uh, if, we, uh, if we want to do that, the thing I would do is I would take a look at, at the class for um, this kind of section. So, so this is a, a paragraph banner, right? Um, this section here. So I'm going to grab the class for paragraph banner. As you see here, that's this whole section here. And I would basically go to my CSS and I would create a new module. I call it banner. Um, and then I would add a class, and I would say, give me all the links and um, make sure their font size is two times as big as some of the other stuff in here. And if I save that, um, ideally my cache is already kind of built to rebuild really easily, so if I reload this, boom, okay. So now we're start styling some of our components and we have them on a component-by-component component based system. Instead of, you know, I feel like it's, it's tempting to get in that process of just, when you start using SAS, it's just nesting things. And definitely you have this kind of boomerang SAS thing, and that's really bad for a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, everything gets compiled into CSS, so you get really, really nested things that become super, super specific. It may be easy for you as someone who's like writing this initially to say, okay, I'm within the header, within this, and within it, and keep nesting it low, and then it's like, it's easy for me to figure out where I am, but if someone ever needs to override some of that stuff, now they're getting really, really specific, and then you get people starting throwing important tags everywhere, and it's just like a battle of who's gonna get their CSS rendered last, right? So like, you don't wanna get, end up in that situation, so put things into these little reusable components and have them, uh, have them easily <coughs> just kind of uh, render, and hopefully, you know, uh, some of this style can be uh, configured by the user to say, if I want a green header or I want whatever header, I want the text in here, I want that, and then everything stays within your theme. And you can limit a lot of these options. So like, for instance, you know, if you were to look at um, 
the color option uh, on. Uh, oops. So if I were to go to site and I were to look at um, this, these color options can be limited. So um, this is a, a module called Color Field that I just added. Just give a quick widget. I just want an easy widget for people to be able to click on. But you can limit these options to the four colors within your theme and make sure that users can only choose those colors. Um, and then you can do some of the hard coding, like every element has the bigger links or whatever it is in your, in your specs. Um, it's just like an easier way of just setting up um, a way for people to create pages. So it's not like every time your client comes to you and says, oh, I want a longer page, an about page that, you know, has some of my team members and, and this and that and all these things. And all of a sudden, you don't want to go back to the design board, like design like a whole new page. You really should have these defined in some kind of component. They think, say, okay, we're using the components that are used elsewhere. You have the power to just kind of add some of these things really easy on the fly and create your own designs. And you stay within our theme so they're not going crazy and making rainbow graphics and, and, and whatever, like, you know, crazy slideshows that, that aren't part of your theme. They're only using components that you've allowed them to add here. Um, and uh, so this thing is not the best example because I kind of let people go off the reservation and kind of crazy, but I would typically I would limit that to a smaller number of things um, that people can do. Um, or or you know, it doesn't have to be for clients. If you don't want your client doing this stuff, you just make it easier for yourself instead of just really you know overriding templates all the time. You just set that up one time, you set up your components, and then you just work with your components that you have. Okay. And I think. Yeah, that, that's, that's it. So, um, I don't know, does anyone have any questions about any of this? Yeah, how did you get Xcode to work on Vim? Um, so, so, actually, I'd love to talk about that. I, uh, so, the short answer is there's a plugin called VDebug. Um, What's that called? Uh, VDebug. And it's, um, yeah, Ben just give him a, th ben just give him a thumbs up. <laughs> I think he's the, the Vim master, so I, uh, I, I look to him for, for answers on, on Vim stuff. But, um, so basically, it, it's, it's really uh, not, not too difficult. Um, you can add that, that plugin, and then if you go to your php.ini file, you just set a couple of, uh, you know, if you're interested. Um, I mean, I know that has nothing to do with this talk, but that's why I stopped using Vim. Oh, yeah? Oh, so, yeah, so there's a, Vim, you can do some really, really cool things. I think I was just touching on the surface of it. And actually, um, Stephanie and I are starting this initiative. Uh, we, we keep rebranding as a bunch of different things. Basically, it's a really bloated Docker container that has, it, you're looking at it here, it's what I'm using here. It has everything you need to kind of get up and going with Drupal development. It's, um, it has Drupal console, Composer, Drush, Vim with Xdebug, already set up. Yeah. What is the name of that one again? Well, we're calling it Start right now. Here, you can you can download it right now as is. Because I did, I built one of those for the last couple of months too. So oh really? Uh, yeah. Well, so do you want to collaborate? Because we're we're thinking we want to make like. So it's called D for DD, which is Docker development. Okay. And it's got like PHP and then some of you Jenkins. Oh, is it is it Docker for Drupal? That's what you're working on? No, D for DD. Okay. So it looks like three or four people all. There's a lot. Something at the same time. Yep. Yeah, so and I just learned that Calabox is Calabox is also yeah. Docker based. I, I didn't realize that. But yeah. if you want to take a look at our thing, um, it, it's here. You can download it. We created a video a while ago um, for a Drupal sprint called uh, Drupal Lamp. So there's some more instructions here, including um, a YouTube video that will get you up and going. So um, we rebranded. We added some new stuff to it. But essentially, you could um, take a look at this video if you wanted a tutorial about like, how to get started with some of this stuff. Um, and we're hoping to make it better over time. And really just, I was sick of fighting headaches all the time, getting, you know, uh, XD blog and all that, because everyone has these struggles, right? Like, how do I get it actually going? How do I get these things going? And I, I hope that this self contained thing would just be like, here you go. Like, just, it's already ready, just add your site. And, and That's called D Start? Yeah, the, the, we have it called uh, D Start. Uh, Something could change, but six people pull it down. Probably, probably just me. Um, but feel free to, to pull it down and look look to our other repository for some directions. But ideally, it will make this a lot easier. Yeah, so we follow the. I kind of follow the ladder now. The ladder now. No, I don't know. Uh, so ladder well, it's ladder well with Docker. Oh, okay, cool. The L and L. So yeah. the idea is that you would pull it down into an individual site, and then it, you set a bunch of environment variables, and it 
and the yeah. Who's yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd love to. I mean, we we have no marketable plan for this. Or like, we, we we think it's cool. We think it'd be great to get new people involved and get people on Vim because, as Benji knows, like I think Vim is a super powerful tool. Like, could could be full IDE if configured properly. Um, great way for people to get into Drupal. And I think not forcing them to set this stuff up, they would actually use the tool. Like for me, when I started using Xdebug, finally. I went from like not from PHP development being a black box to like releasing a bunch of like small contributing volumes. So like there's a huge difference between getting these tools to, to work well. And I think if you could just start with something like this, it would be a lot easier for people. But um, you know, I think the biggest thing more than getting this even better is us getting some great documentation, some good video tutorials and everything. So um, if you want to see just like a, a hint at what what we're thinking we would be doing, just just take a look at you know this YouTube video here and. Uh, I think I'll, I'll show you kind of what we're thinking we will do for that. And especially if you're interested in it, let us know because, you know, uh, we want to make sure there's actually a reason to do it. So, any questions? Any other questions? Great. Go on the way back. You had a builder content type. You had a field, and you, I think you called them attachments, but those are just paragraph bundles, right? You were choosing from? Yeah, so, yep. So the builder, um, the builder essentially. All it does is, is a paragraph reference, and it goes to the whole list of all the paragraphs I created. And for people who aren't familiar with paragraphs, if you came from like field selections or something like that, it's similar. So I basically specify a bunch of fields. For instance, like the header, I have a text field, a color widget, and a little select list of the size, right? So you can kind of bundle together, and then my builders can reference any of those components. So whether I'm creating a block or a content type, I'm just like, I want to add the banner, I want to add this, and I can Okay, thank you guys. Thanks.